a convoy of deal makers and expectation. After a night of renewed hope, a morning of re-energised diplomacy as Brexit Secretary Steve Barclay arrived at the EU Commission. There were mixed signals from the official photos released by Brussels, but after almost two hours of talks, positive noises from the EU's chief negotiator against a background chorus of negative ones from protesters. The breakthrough inside. Keep calm, keep calm, breathe. Yeah. Keep calm. Just a few words. Uh, we had a constructive meeting with Steve Barclay and the British team, and now I'm going to debrief the 27 ambassadors and the Brexit steering group of the Parliament. But as already said that the Brexit is like climbing a mountain. We need uh, vigilance, determination and patience. Are we near the, the you need the peak of that mountain yet? Has there been a breakthrough? Are you near the peak of that mountain? We will see, we will see. Do you think that this is the breakthrough we've been looking for? Who moved first? Have the, have the this question of all was this. Are Michel Barnier and his team about to enter the tunnel? The technical term for when negotiating staff hunker down for intense discussions to hammer out a deal. And would this man be recommending that to ambassadors from 27 EU nations? Mr Barnier, what will you be telling the other 27? Please, please, please. Let me work, please. The more sensitive the negotiations, the tighter the lips. Saying nothing but tweeting after the meeting, we are intensifying technical discussions with the UK over the coming days in a constructive spirit. I will continue to debrief the European Parliament and member states. The EU will do everything it can for an agreement fully in line with our principles. Topped off with an emoji of that mountain he says there is to climb and a picture of him smiling with Stephen Barclay. Careful language, intensified discussions, but no talk of tunnels. We're not going to need any physical infrastructure. So just what did Boris Johnson offer his Irish counterpart yesterday to progress negotiations? That's the plan, anyway. As the Prime Minister visited a school today, rumours swirled that maybe he'd soften his position on guarantees Northern Ireland... What do, you, what do you think the tiger looks like in the storm? ...will leave on the same terms as the rest of the UK. Rumours he wouldn't he, be drawn he was, uh, on. Can you still promise, for example, that Northern Ireland will come out of the EU Customs Union? Well, I can certainly tell you that uh, under no circumstances will we see anything that uh, damages the ability of the whole of the United Kingdom to take full advantage of, uh, of Brexit. Can you tell me categorically that Northern Ireland is leaving the EU Customs Union? I, I think it would be uh, wrong of me to give a running commentary on the, on the negotiations. Evasion from the Prime Minister, caution from the President of the European Council. There is no guarantee of success and the time is practically up. But even the slightest chance must be used. The no deal Brexit will never be the choice of the EU. The Brexit secretary left Brussels this afternoon, leaving behind his negotiators to try and find light at the end of a tunnel that as yet doesn't quite exist. Well, Paul, you've had a busy day hot on the heels of Michel Barnier. What is the mood there now? Well, caution, because of course they about, well, of course, there's caution because, of course, they've been through all this before with Theresa May's deal. And adding to that caution is, at the moment, an uncertainty as to whether or not the DUP are fully aware and on top of the details of these negotiations. This afternoon, DUP put out a statement saying they're in regular contact with the Prime Minister and he's aware of their views. But that leaves a lot of questions, primarily of which... Could we be in this situation yet again where a deal is agreed here that has, to say the least, problems back in Westminster? Thanks, Paul. Well, earlier I talked to the French MEP and her country's former Europe minister, Nathalie Loiseau, and I started by asking how this week's talks had gone from the EU's perspective. And yesterday's meeting with uh, Leo Varadkar uh, showed that there was possibility that the British proposal from October 2nd could move in a better direction. So uh, yes, Michel Barnier and his staff are working hard with the British negotiator. Have you heard that from him directly? Yeah. Right, so he's much more positive than he was, because he was very he's cautious. negative at the beginning of the week. He's cautious, but he's determined 
to find a way, uh, as he has always been. But the nitty gritty of it, it seems mm. to focus once again on Northern Ireland. Northern sure. Ireland inside the European Customs Union. We are working on something solid. Uh, the first proposal of October the 2nd, uh, where there was no hard border, but actually two borders, mm. uh, was not workable. Mm -hmm. You have to be certain of what's happening. SMEs, but also big companies, mm. we want to make sure that goods and services going south and north in Ireland uh, have proper checks, or, or you have Northern Ireland remaining in the custom union. I'm an optimist by nature because I'm in politics. Mm. So we always have to think that until uh, we have not uh, ended up with a, an absence of solution, mm. we have to try to find one. And we will do our best, goodwill, good faith, but there is a need for trust. And not only from the prime minister, let us be very honest, we have to make sure that any possible scenario is backed by the British Parliament. Otherwise, me as an MEP, member of the European mm. Parliament, I would not be able to ratify something that is not ratified by the British Parliament. Are we now about to enter the famous tunnel? And more importantly, can you see light at the end of the tunnel? We will do our best efforts, but I cannot tell you yet that it will be sufficient to strike a deal, and especially to strike a deal before October 31st, because it's 20 days ahead. If having built up these expectations in a positive way, mm -hmm. it all falls apart in Brussels next week, the consequences will be pretty catastrophic. You know, the consequences of a no deal are obviously bad. They are terrible for the UK, they are not good for the 27. But the consequences of a rushed deal or a bad deal would be terrible for the future of the European Union. So we have to keep that balance in Are you mind. saying a bad deal is worse than no deal? Sure. That's what Theresa May used to say. But that's true for us as well. A bad deal is worse than no deal. There's no doubt, because no deal is very bad, but that's not the end of the story. A no deal means you don't agree on the way you divorce, but then you have to meet again. Do you think that this Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is negotiating in good faith? We were puzzled and troubled by some words spoken, some attitudes. My message is it's time to get serious. Might be boring, but it's time to is, work hard. Is there another way of saying that, which is that actually at the end of the day, we, the European Union, are terrified of a no-deal Brexit because of the impact it has on our economies? No, we are not. But Boris Johnson's put it on the table in the way that Theresa May never did. Surely that has concentrated yes, minds. Yes, and the Parliament voted the Ben Act to tell him not to do so. Natalie Rosso, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Well, our political correspondent Liz Bates is in Downing Street tonight and joins us now. How confident are they sounding about getting a deal? tricky to get a sense of that at the moment because Downing Street has been unusually tight-lipped since that meeting with Boris Johnson and Leo Varadkar. It could actually be a sign that as the Brexit talks have ramped up over the past few days that there are real efforts being made here to ensure that nothing jeopardises that. Um, but as the Brexit talks in Brussels have moved on to the next stage, thoughts here have turned to whether if there was a deal, Boris Johnson could actually get that through the House of Commons. Now, we heard what the DUP have had to say about that, but I've been speaking to one of the hardcore Tory Eurosceptics on that, and they were saying to me um, that although they need more detail, they would be open to supporting a deal. So very early stages, but that's a positive sign for the Prime Minister if he can bring a deal back. And in the meantime, they're spending money on no-deal preparations like it's going out of fashion. Yes, they are. It's interesting because although the rhetoric has been very positive over the past few days, the government's still very much preparing for a no-deal Brexit. We had an announcement from the Department for Transport today. Um, they have awarded new ferry contracts, £86 million worth, to four companies. That is to ensure that vital medicine supplies continue to flow into the UK after a no-deal Brexit. Whether those contingency plans will ever have to be used will depend, of course, on what comes out of these talks over the coming days. Liz Bates in Downing Street. Now, leave has been cancelled for thousands of police officers and 26 forces across the country in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Police chiefs have been outlining their updated preparations for October the 31st, saying their new legislation will be needed on powers of arrest if access 
to EU systems have to be switched off. Here's our senior home affairs correspondent, Sam in Israel. Police chiefs have prepared for a reasonable worst case scenario, they say, come a no deal Brexit. That means from mid October to mid November, all officers are being denied leave in more than half the UK's police forces. They say that as yet, there is no expectation of violent protest. But monitoring Westminster events last month. A disgrace! He should be absolutely sh ashamed of himself. I've never heard such humbug in all my life. Suggested, they said, a link between spikes in hate crime and debates in Parliament. Figures are due out next week. As one senior officer said, it's not necessarily what's being debated, but the way things are said. Last night, Channel 4 News explored the impact on some MPs who become hate crime targets as a result. Inside the International Crime Coordination Centre, they're preparing for the moment they may have to switch off access to EU databases. The National Police Chiefs Council has revealed that in 2018-19, 1,412 suspects were arrested in the UK on a European arrest warrant, while 190 were returned to the UK from an EU state on the same warrant. And since 2004, the system has meant more than 11,000 individuals have been handed over to EU countries by UK police. A lot of the stuff we're doing at the moment is giving advice to forces about, you know, being more advanced, looking at who's coming into the country uh, and understanding their powers as much as they possibly can. So you're trying to prevent you ending up without being able to arrest someone? Yes. Come the well, 1st of November? Yeah, we're trying to get ourselves as closely to where we are now, which means that we can still arrest people, we can still be as efficient and effective as we are now with EU tools. So it's all about identifying gaps, closing those gaps down, just so we can keep our community safe. But whatever the amount of preparation, there's still the question whether it's enough to maintain the status quo. To close those gaps and restore powers of arrest in some cases will require emergency legislation. It's high on the Home Office agenda, police chiefs say, in the event of no deal.